whenever someone has children, it just um, lowers their time preference even more because they're starting to think about the next generation and the next and grandkids and great grandkids. And uh, I know it's a cliche, we all want to leave the world a better place. Um, what I think Bitcoiners have discovered that much of the world has not yet discovered is actually that improving our monetary system might is probably the number one way you, you can leave the world a better place. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It, again, I'm laughing because I know that so many of my friends would think I'm crazy for saying that because they're not really into Bitcoin. But I, I believe it with every fiber of my body. All right, John, we're live. How are you doing? Very good, Kayvon. Excited to get into this. Thanks for having me. Awesome. <laughs> I've been really looking forward to this discussion. Um, let me just, um, John, let me just um, uh, give a, uh, you know, say a few words about you, but uh, I would, I'd love to, you know, to have you yourself introduce yourself a little bit more because I, I'm really curious, like how you got into Bitcoin, you know, and the whole aspects of Bitcoin. So, um, first of all, I mean, the initial uh, reason uh, uh, and inspiration are, 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 uh, that uh, I wanted to have this chat with you is um, this um, Twitter thread. Let me just uh, sh share the screen here so everyone can see this. The, it goes, it starts off with a false narrative going around the Bitcoin community. It's about the uh, sort of uh, the tech productivity driven deflation is incom incompatible with indebted governments because they want and need inflation. And then you go on, you know, uh, you know, very structured. Uh, so this is the initial reason. Um, and yeah, and um, and your your background is really fascinating. Uh, so you're you you're the managing director of pr uh, private client services at Swan Bitcoin. Uh, um uh for how long john uh almost two years now i joined swan at the beginning oh, wow. of 2022 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and but you had previously spent 13 years on wall street uh where you were a portfolio manager and asset manager also can i call it an institutional investor in goldman sachs exactly yeah there's a lot of different as wall street does there's many different terms that mean the same thing but investment management portfolio management uh, institutional investing, the buy side, all kind of refers to the same thing. Fascinating. So um, I managed to read your articles. It was a little bit short term, um, but I managed to read your both articles. Fascinating written, especially, you know, for beginners, noobs, or uh, anybody who questions, you know, the, the whole, you know, so-called legacy. It sounds, sounds like an understatement, but this whole <laughs> legacy system. But uh, I would uh, urge and uh, really recommend your articles, How Legacy Finance Perceives Bitcoin, Observations from a 13-Year uh, Career at Goldman Sachs, and the other one, Fixed Supply Money Does Not Lead to Economic Collapse, and Why It Is In Fact the Only Intellectually and Ethically Defensible Monetary System. Okay. Your stage, John. Uh, first of all, I'm really curious. Uh, what was the inspiration? What, what was the the aha moment, the vision, the mission within you when you got like, or what was the first touching moments uh, with Bitcoin? Yeah. So for me, it was sound money before it was Bitcoin, and the real first trigger was the financial crisis. So for me, a huge piece of the story is that I was a college senior in 2008 and 2009. Um, that was a very interesting time to be graduating really in anything, but I had a degree in finance. So to be graduating in 2008, 2009 as a finance major, you're trying to get jobs at Wall Street banks. And I can literally remember some of them uh, from their you know, uh, HR type departments coming to our campus and saying, hey, we're here because it's our job to come to this career fair, but we actually have no jobs to offer any of you right now. And we're just like, you know, okay, I'm not sure what to do about that. Um, but, uh, and, and they were wondering, you know, they don't, they didn't know if they were going to have a job next month. They didn't know if their bank was going to be around next month. So it was just a really interesting time um, for a lot of reasons. But one of those reasons was just that there was this massive financial crisis that, uh, happened. And it's just objectively true that the people who were tasked with managing our economic system, whether it's people at the Fed, whether it's the Treasury Secretary, or just politicians in general, um, even CEOs of banks, really none of them saw it coming. 
Um, you know, we could just say that that's true in hindsight. And I don't mean to say that as if I was a 20 year old college kid and that I saw it coming. I certainly did not. But I was able to see that these people who you think are supposed to see it coming were unable to see it coming. So that for me was like the first trigger, first light bulb moment that I said, okay, I've got to look elsewhere. Um, and I've got to, I have to unfortunately put my college professors in that same bucket. Um, none of them were really able to see it coming. None of them were evil, evil, even able to explain it as it was happening. Um, so for me, that just meant, okay, uh, I'm going to look elsewhere for answers. And uh, I somehow came across the Mises Institute, uh, Mises.org. That's M-I-S-E-S for anyone who's uh, unfamiliar with that. It's named after Ludwig von Mises, one of the great Austrian economists. And uh, that was my first introduction to Austrian economics. So many things happened from there. Firstly, I said, why have I never even heard of this thing called Austrian economics? Same question. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and, and again, I was a finance major. So I took finance classes. I took economics classes. And it's my senior year. So I'm almost done with college. And I've never even heard of Austrian economics. Uh, I'd never even heard the term sound money. Um, to the extent that we talked about the gold standard at all in my classes, it was like a passing paragraph where they said, oh, the gold standard is really bad because it doesn't provide you with flexibility to manage your monetary system. And, and they just like move on. And they're like, you know, thank goodness we don't have the gold standard anymore. Um, but there's so much more to it than that. And uh, Mises.org provides that. It, it So many good articles, PDF books, also actually a forum where you could have discussions with people. And back in like 2009, 2010, that was kind of a big deal because Twitter was not what it is today. Um, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, every, like Reddit, th those things really didn't exist the way they do today. So I spent so much time in that forum, reading articles, reading books, and for me, it actually made sense. So timeline-wise, speeding this up a bit, uh, first it was sound money for me, but that meant gold. Um, I just I was one of these people that believed you know the answer is to go back on a gold standard, and it wasn't until 2013 that I first heard of Bitcoin, and I heard it from a friend. And the interesting thing about my story is that I immediately said, "Wow, this is interesting because they're trying to do digital sound money." Really? Um, because then you're the opposite of sailor who just dismissed it. It's like, ah, just casino, whatever, <laughs> speculation, gambling money, right? I mean, something like that. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I do have an interesting story in that sense. Now, I wish my next thought was, this is great. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to learn more about it. Unfortunately, my next thought was, you know, okay, they're trying to do digital sound money, but that will never catch on. <laughs> and... Uh, my thought was just that, you know, gold has this history of being money for literally thousands of years. It's physical, it's tangible. Um, people are just not going to buy the internet version of gold. Um, so I said, nice idea. It's not going to work. And then I, I do have to say at the time, I didn't know, I, it's not as if I understood, you know, how Bitcoin works. I, they said there's 21 million. I thought, how do I know there's 21 million? Uh, how do I go buy some? I heard of these Bitcoin ATMs. What am I going to do? Just put, you know, $100 bills in it. And what if somebody's staking out the machine? And there was so much friction to it at the time. So I, it, I just said, you know, I don't even think it's going to catch on, but it's also very confusing. So I'm not, not going to do it. And it took me four years until 2017. It's late 2017. So maybe, maybe even like five Eight years. years. It's an unbelievable perils. But you know what? I mean, to be honest with me, I mean, you, I mean, how many so called OGs or old, you know, old, uh, like, like, like geniuses, you know, like who are totally, you know, intellectually and, uh, you know, cognitively, like who, who, who could have, you know, understood uh, the technological aspect, monitor, I mean, uh, just dismissed it at first. And you, you hear the, all those stories from a lot of, you know, prominent Bitcoiners, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I think that it, everyone's story is, you know, unique, but there are, is a lot of overlap. And I think one of the huge things of overlap is that it's actually very rare to hear someone who heard of Bitcoin for the first time and immediately was like, oh, that's going to be so significant. And I understand it. And I want to get involved right now. Usually it's, it's healthy skepticism for a long time. 
And I think that's probably good. You want people to build up that um, conviction. It, it's hard to just hear about something and immediately have conviction in it, uh, you know, 10 minutes later. So I, I think that's kind of normal. Um, but then I'll just like speed up the, the rest of this. Basically, 2017 happens. I think that's like the first mainstream bull run in Bitcoin. Um, you know, there's obviously have been cycles throughout Bitcoin's whole history, but 2017, uh, I was working at Goldman at the time. My colleagues were talking about it. Uh, banks, CEOs were talking about it, mo mostly negatively, but they were still talking about it. Uh, CNBC's talking about it. Bloomberg's talking about it. So I said, okay, maybe this is a real thing. I'm going to start to learn more about it. I'm going to get involved. Um, and then I don't know if this was the case for you, but I probably got too bullish because my thought was like, okay, Bitcoin is here. Everyone understands sound money now. They're going to get this. <laughs> and, uh, and then it was like, you know, bottom falls out of the bull market. People think Bitcoin is dead again. There was the whole fork wars thing. Which one's the real Bitcoin? Uh, and, and that was like kind of a confusing thing to navigate. Um, so it certainly just, it wasn't like, oh, Bitcoin's here now and, it, and everything's easy. Um, so there was like uh, kind of a lot of a lot of learning that I've had to do, and I'm obviously still learning every single day about it. But um, that's kind of my my story. And then in terms of the career side, in 2017, there weren't very obvious places to go work. Um, I, I'm not a, a tech um, software developer coder, so I wasn't going to go build something. I did have a few people that left Wall Street to go start a crypto hedge fund type of thing around 17, 18, and had conversations with them. But I'm glad that I had the economic background because to me, Bitcoin was always meant to be money. It's, it's not meant to be this portfolio that you hold 75 different tokens and you trade the ups and downs. That's just not what Bitcoin is. That's like a misunderstanding of what Bitcoin and crypto generally is. Um, so I'm glad I passed on that. Um, and then as 2020 came around, 2021, started hearing about companies, whether it's like Swan or Nidig or others. And I said, you know what? I think my background actually is compatible with what these companies are looking to do. And then I got linked up with some people at Swan, uh, met you know CEO Corey, met people like Steven Luca and others, just became very impressed with what they were building. And I said, you know what? I think it makes sense for me to take the leap from Wall Street to Swan. And then, like I said, I've been at Swan for uh, coming up on two years. Awesome. You know, um, I was just been thinking, I mean, we both know, you know, Bitcoin is, um, uh, especially when you, you know, after thousands of hours of listening to podcasts, reading books, articles, and this and that going deeper, deeper, it's a very multifaceted rabbit hole, right? But uh, I always tell people when we, when we do like presentations, you know, for newbies, you know, here in Austria, uh, uh, I tell them, you know, you don't need to understand I me. Mean, do you know, do you know how to, how the internet works? Do you know how your, really your, your engine, your car engine works, your TV works? Not really, right? You understand the principles, right? And that's what it takes. You need to understand the principles, the essence, uh, the fundamental principles of Bitcoin. Like, for example, the absolute scarcity, the immutable absolute scarcity of Bitcoin. If that's if just that one parameter or that, that, that's, that's the main factor, actually, is, yeah, um, so yeah, I, I had some other thoughts, but uh, why don't you go on? Just go on. I have I have uh, some other questions in my background, but in my brain, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, but but yeah, why don't we? Uh, because you you uh, you send me uh, a list of subtopics that you want wanted to talk about. Of course, I want to talk about deflation technology because for very specific reasons, I want to know your take because I see such huge potential for humanity and civilization, especially when the time is running out. You know. Um, we need to accelerate a little bit this process, but I have my very fundamental scientific and realistic and you know fact factual based reasons why we need to accelerate this process. But um, why don't you talk, start talking about the subtopics you want to talk about, and then we'll just smoothly you know glide into the you know the most important topic. I think that's the techno te technological monetary uh, deflation, or as Jeff Booth calls it, uh, the key to an abundant future. Right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, 
Would love to. I'll try to hit on some of these and then we can dig in if, if you want. And then, like you said, we can talk about that technology deflation versus monetary deflation and what governments want and that whole topic, because I, I do believe it's very interesting. So I would say one of the things that I, I probably have the most experience and ability to speak on is just what is it like to work on Wall Street? What what are those people like um, from you know your average person all the way up to a very high level um, person within Wall Street? Um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of Wall Street? What are their blind spots? How do they think about Bitcoin? Because I left Wall Street at the beginning of 2022. So I actually was having conversations with people about uh, gold, sound money, Bitcoin for years, um, going back even before 2017. And, and to be fair, it's not as if these were topics that came up every day. But, you know, these are people you work with for 10, 12, or sometimes more hours a day. And sometimes economic conversations would come up. And for myself, going back to 2010, I was this Austrian economics proponent, gold standard, sound money. So I would always, you know, put that out there and see what people thought about it. So I actually have many, many data points to see what people think and how they respond. Um and but hey, analogy. good for you. You planted so many seeds. You don't even know, you know what's <laughs> going to come out of it in one in a year or two. You know, I'm sorry to interrupt. Sorry. No, no, that's true. And um, on that topic of planting seeds, uh, LinkedIn, as we all know, uh, is a place where people from Wall Street and corporate America spend a lot more time than Twitter, generally speaking. Whereas the Bitcoin community, you know, Twitter, 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 um, and like a little bit of LinkedIn and other things, but it's like main place is Twitter. Um, I have had a few people from my past career, former coworkers have, because I'll post on LinkedIn every once in a while. And some of them have said like, oh, hey, I see these things you're saying about Bitcoin. Like, you know, that's a good point. Like it, it's, a, it's a seed to be fair. It's, it's far from being a tree, but you know, you got to start somewhere. So on that point, um, the analogy I would give for people who work on Wall Street is, um, People, uh, medicine, mainstream medicine, people who work in the healthcare industry and their thoughts on nutrition is actually very similar to people who work on Wall Street and their thoughts on money and economics. And what I mean by that is, unfortunately, most people who work in medicine and healthcare, uh, nutrition is not a focus for them. They might pretend that they know something about it, but they're really just regurgitating things that they've heard elsewhere. And unfortunately, it, those things they're regurgitating are really not based on good reasoning, good data, good evidence. Um, and, and the same is, is kind of true for Wall Street and money and economics. And if I were going to defend them a little bit, I would say the reason is that on at these big Wall Street banks, you get hired, you're kind of like a cog in a wheel. You're doing this very specific thing and you might get very, very good at it. But that doesn't mean you're going to understand the whole picture. And, and it's kind of the same thing with people in medicine and healthcare. You might be hired as a doctor or a nurse and you do this very specific thing and you might be great at it. But that doesn't mean you have a good understanding of optimal human nutrition and sleep and circadian rhythm. So we kind of have to remember that because we fall into this trap where we just think, oh, he or she works on Wall Street. She, they must understand everything about money because Wall Street has to do with money. Oh, they're, they're a doctor. They're a nurse. They must know everything about nutrition. And it's, it's just not true. And if anything, the, unfortunately, the opposite has been true. The mainstream beliefs about money and economics, just like with nutrition, have, have unfortunately been incorrect. So that's the main thing I would say about talking to someone about money and economics on Wall Street. They're not even that well-versed in like Keynesian or MMT economics. They take more of an ambivalent approach. They're kind of just like, hey, I don't spend my time doing that because what's the point? I got hired to do this thing at Goldman Sachs and I can make a good career. And, and it's not malicious either. Some of them just want to do their career and go home and spend time with their families. They don't even want to debate whether the Federal Reserve should exist or not. Um, so that was a big takeaway for me. Um, 
and and there's more we can get into there but um that that kind of is like a short summary of that first article about legacy finance perceiving uh, it's a fantastic bitcoin fantastic overview and and you know i mean of course uh, and first of all i wanted to, i mean I, I heard that from someone i think it was a nuclear engineer he said uh, the problem is with with people you know in the mainstream science main you know or, or specific fields and the more titles you have, i mean i have myself a phd in law and I've seen people, you know, I mean, especially when you get go into the academic process, you know, the intellectual process, your uh, worldview, you know, your, what do you call it? Bandwidth scope, you know, it's like a funnel, you know, but it goes like it, it becomes narrower and narrow, you know, the more titles and PhDs you have, it seems like, you know, no, it doesn't seem it's actually factually. It's, I, I mean, uh, uh, you, you meet people that have like, you know, common sense, you know, who have no titles, who have no whatever academic titles, and they're much smarter, clever, open-minded, and more curious. I mean, just so, you know, just look at J Joe Rogan. I mean, he's a, you know, he's a wonderful, you know, uh, podcaster, but but at least, you know, he's he's open-minded, he asks questions, he questions, you know, the reality around, but this is our problem. To be honest with you, I, I woke up, uh, you know, pretty late, I would say, you know, on a lot of topics, you know, I went into a lot of rabbit holes, would it be, you know, myself as an ex-smoker into internal documents of the tobacco industry and then wrote my PhD about it. But anyway, right. it's not about me, I'm just saying, you know, it's like this natural bias and prejudice that I guess, you know, people in your uh, past, uh, you know, like Goldman Sachs people uh, develop, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you made me think of a, a bunch of things there. One of which is, um, and I wrote this in the article, and I think it is important because you don't want people to get trapped at the other end of the spectrum, which is, hey, let's not believe what any expert, any specialist has to say, because now I believe the experts are all wrong and the specialists are all wrong. That would be too extreme as well. Um, you don't want to just have a blind rule that says, I don't trust the experts anymore. Um, so I just like, that's important to say, but at the same time, um, you have to acknowledge that whether it's the food pyramid, whether it's the idea that you should eat high carb, low fat, um, saturated fats will clog your arteries, um, eat six servings of carbs per day. Um, all these things have led to chronic diseases and we, you know, seed oils. I know that's become kind of a meme in the Bitcoin community, but these are the things that mainstream medicine was pushing. And I think it it's just objectively true now that it was wrong. You look at the same thing with economics and Fed chairs consistently don't know what is going to happen in the economy. Um, whether it's Ben Bernanke going into 2008, he has like a dozen quotes that just you you he makes the quote and then you wait anywhere from like a week to a few months later and the exact opposite happens. What, and then you have Yellen and Powell with inflation is transitory. It just keeps happening over and over and over again. So I just put that out there because if if these experts actually had a good track record, then I would have no problem listening to them. But you just can't look at the last, and for me, it's the last like 20 years just because of my age, but I'm sure it's been going on longer than that. But at least in the last 20 years, you can't ignore the fact that these experts have been wrong about some of the most critical things, especially when it comes to, again, healthcare, nutrition, and money and economics. Wow. So from yeah. there, um, I'd be happy. What the, the second article was kind of like um, an expansion of the first one, because one of the key things that you'll hear from people on Wall Street about money and economics, they repeat this um, phrase, which is, well, if the economy is growing, then you need more units of money. And that, I think, is one of the biggest false narrative. You know, <clears throat> we started um, our chat talking about a false narrative about the tech deflation thing. And and to be fair, that's like a, a, a fairly nuanced point that uh, I think it's important, but it's like very nuanced. The false narrative about we need more units of money to achieve more economic growth, that is like the elephant in the room. Like that is the, the narrative that underpins so much of Keynesian economics, MMT, uh, even free bankers who are like, free bankers are not that far away from Austrians and Bitcoiners, but even they believe that you need more money to achieve more economic growth. Um, so that was the point of the second article I wrote. Uh, I really just wanted to like pick it apart and show why it's not true. 
Um, so we could get into that one, but I think that one's pretty critical because like I said, pretty much every school of economic thought other than the Austrians believes that to, to some extent. Yeah. And I think they've done the system, let's just call it, has done a tremendous job, like brainwashing people. Like, you know, like we need inflation, like whatever, because of price stability, like the 2%, but deflation is evil. You know, I mean, this, this indoctrination dogma, I mean, they've done a tremendous job doing, you know, brainwashing us, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. It's, you hear it everywhere from, from the first time you take an economics class in high school, you hear it in college, you hear it repeated in the financial media, politicians repeat it. The central bank repeats it. Uh, they do studies that you know claim to support it. And so you just hear it everywhere. But I would argue that upon actually inspecting it, it's, it's really not true. So I tried to pick apart six different beliefs that these people who you could call it expansionary money and credit is, is maybe the you know, way the, the terminology to use. These proponents of expansionary money and credit they typically say things like you need it for more economic growth. They say things like if prices decline, everyone will hoard everything and economic growth will just grind to a halt. And then they also say that it's unfair for purchasing power to be maintained over time because they say, hey, you did nothing. You just you know, had your money under a mattress and then you got to buy more with it 10 years later. That's not fair. They claim that. Um and then fourthly, uh, they say, and this this one's not everyone, but some of them claim this, that you need to create more money in order to dis redistribute resources with, within society. And then fifthly, it's, it's five, um, that we need expansionary money and credit to stimulate. And I put stimulate in quotes because I think that is giving themselves way too much credit. They, they believe it's stimulative um, during times of recession. So... In the article, I tried to go through each of these points to show why I don't think any of them are true. Uh, but I did my best to steel man the argument because those are the five points that I have heard repeated over and over and over again. So that was kind of uh, the gist of that article. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to like... Uh, um, uh... Uh, elaborate a little bit on 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 the other article too, a little bit, or or are we are we done with the uh, with the overall like your general thesis? Yeah, I would encourage people to uh, check out the article because it is it is a little bit dense of a topic. I tried to put it in layman's terms. Maybe there's a couple things I could call out from it. Um, there is this difference between something that the Austrians call circulation credit versus commodity credit. So you will you might often um, hear someone critique the Austrians and say, oh, you Austrians, um, and not, not Austrians like you. Uh, is, is everyone an Austrian economist in, uh, by you? That's, that must be fantastic. <laughs> I wish he was. Yeah, I wish he was. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, you, do you know Rahim Tari? He was. He's been on, on a couple of conferences now. Uh, he's actually half Persian. Uh, like, but I'm a full Persian. But he's half Persian. I think he used to be a nuclear engineer. I say super brain. Rahim Tari but but he's he's got the school of econo Austrian economics. I mean, he is of Scholarium. I think it's called. So um, maybe you should, you should give it a listen. I think you just did a, a, a podcast interview with Robert Breedlove, a pretty very intense, deep. I mean, it's it's too intellectual for me, too theoretical, philosophical. But but uh, he's he's one of the because he lives in Austria. You know, he's an Austrian, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. No, thanks for flagging that. I, I would like to check that out. Yeah, I'll send it to you. Yeah, please do. And um, yeah, so one of these critiques that people throw at anyone from the Austrian School of Economics, they might say, oh, you guys are anti-credit. You know, you, you think that there should be no credit. And it's not quite true. Uh, Austrians are fine with credit. We just don't believe that you should pair credit with money being created out of thin air. And that's the difference between commodity credit or circulation credit. Um, it's easier to explain on a gold standard with a commodity money because you just say, there's um, actually with Bitcoin, it's, it's fairly easy to explain too, but let's just say you have a hundred ounces of gold that exists in the world. You can o only one person can have that gold at a time. And, and if I decide, hey, I'm going to lend Kayvon one ounce of gold, 
it left my custody. It went to your custody. There's still a hundred ounces of gold. That's commodity credit. That's perfectly fine. It doesn't change the money supply. Circulation credit is something different. It's when you have a hundred ounces of gold and now I'm a bank. And instead of giving you one ounce of gold, I give you a piece of paper that says, this is one ounce of gold. So now you have money of a hundred ounces of gold plus this one piece of paper that's redeemable for an ounce of gold, you now have 101 ounces of gold in the system. You've inflated the money supply. And the Austrians believe that this causes economic distortions. Um, I would argue that it is also a transfer of wealth because you, the bank didn't have to earn the money in order to lend it. I, I think that's actually a fundamental principle that's being violated. In order to lend something, you had to earn it first. Yeah. And this um, is where the Cantillon effect starts or right? I mean, like I think this is related to the to mm -hmm. the Cantillon effect for sure. Um it, it yeah. There, Maybe I think you can just explain ways. it in your own words what's the Cantillon because I'm, I'm, <laughs> you're probably better at it. Yeah. I, I think it can take different shapes and forms, but it essentially is when you create money out of thin air, um we have to remember that money is not a consumable good. We, we don't, no one actually wants money for the sake of money. We just want money for what it can eventually buy us. Um, everyone kind of, you know, knows that, but, um, money is incredibly value, valuable for its medium of exchange purposes. So the fact that when you create money out of thin air, you haven't actually created more real resources in society to be used, to be consumed. So if you create more money out of thin air, someone is going to benefit, but it's just the person who gets to use that money for their own purposes. But because you haven't created more resources, it's not a win-win situation. If, if I just you know work very hard to create uh, a car and you work very, very hard to create a house and you know, I, I I build two cars, you build two houses, and then we say, okay, great, I'll give you a car, you give me a house. That's a win-win. We we just built something and then we traded it. So there's more resources, it's a win-win. If you just create money out of thin air, you haven't actually created more houses, more cars, more anything. So if you just create the money and then someone gets to use it to go out in society to buy something, they're simply gaining at the expense of everyone else. And the the Cantillon effect, um, I've heard it pronounced many different different ways. I call it the Cantillon yeah. effect. Was it but, French, the guy, Cantillon? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe I need to throw an accent on there. But uh, um, yeah, so the, the Cantillon effect basically says that the people who are closest to the money creation benefit the most. But again, it's it's not that there there's nothing wrong with benefiting, meaning growing the economic pie with new production. That That's a win-win. The Cantillon effect is a zero sum game. When you create money, someone is benefiting at the expense of someone else. Um, so unfortunately, uh, that, that's, that's unfortunately what happens with when you have money created out of thin air. What that's just, you know, objectively true. John, I mean, let's just call it what it is. And, you know, you've heard it probably from other Bitcoiners or thinkers too. We got to articulate it. It's systemic theft, legalized yeah. systemic theft inherently, systematically. This is what's so, I mean, uh, it's a hard, uh, bitter uh, pillow, uh, pillow uh, pill to swallow for a lot of people. But understanding, you know, this, uh, the whole, whatever you want to call it, fractional reserve banking, uh, uh, circulation credit, central, the whole central banking fiat system is one giant, gigantic, uh, you know, systemic theft and beyond fraud. And yeah. Yeah. And, and one thing that I like to pose to you, uh, friends or contacts who they're really not into Bitcoin. Um, so you can't like push too hard and start explaining Bitcoin to them. And this is no, how mining works. And this how, you know, it's put on the silty gloves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to, you know, really just like throw little bits of information at them. Um, one thing I like to do to get people thinking is just ask them the question, hey, why is counterfeiting money illegal? And I like to have them answer it because I think if like, I don't, I don't want them to pause and, you know, me start answering it because I, and I know you and I are aligned on this question, but what the hope is that 
they start saying, well, yeah, when you create, you know, new money, you're basically just stealing from everyone else. That's the reason why counterfeiting is illegal. Uh, so <laughs> you have to, you have to now admit that. And the, like the cop out here is, well, we give, you know, the government and the banking system the ability to do it because we think they're going to do it for the right reason. And the, like you do the, all these mental gymnastics, but at the end of the day, it it's still taking resources from other people. Even if you believe it's okay that the banking system does it, they still, that it's still happening. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think, I mean, I've, of course, I'm, I've, I've, tum- I've stumbled upon this, uh, this question over and over again, but it's actually a very, uh, like 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 uh, simple question like why is count yeah, seriously yeah why is counterfeiting uh, illegal and and yeah punishable by <laughs> I mean they come after you with the whole secret service right I mean <laughs> and the whole intelligence complex going to come after you so uh, anyway yeah yeah it's an excellent question yeah I should I should I should internalize that yeah good question. Yeah. And if you're thinking about counterfeiting money and they come after you, just tell them, hey, I was just stimulating the economy. Don't <laughs> don't come after me here. Okay, okay John, let's talk about, um, yeah, uh, this is a fundamentally important question, this uh, technological monetary deflation. Uh, and, and, you know, and, you know I'm, I'm a huge fan, of course, of Jeff Booth and, and read his book so many times and given it and recommended it. I orange pilled my, 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 my uh, wife's uh, brother <laughs> totally, you know, so for, for a couple of years now, I've totally orange pilled him. And uh, especially with Jeff Booth's book, and now he's writing his own math- master thesis on deflation and real estate i don't know the exact working title but i can uh, let's let's you know uh, stay in, in touch uh, because uh, he's going to be actually in in march uh, in uh, what is it called in in this conference in um madeira so he's going to oh, talk yeah. with bitcoin me. atlantis is it yeah 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 he's going to go there with his whole family unfortunately we we can't really we can't even afford it right now but it's going to be amazing because he needs he needs to talk directly to jeff Booth, and i'm going to introduce him sort of uh yeah via <laughs> chat or something um anyway um let's talk about the you know why do, would you know why why i'm so fascinated by technological monetary deflation i can guess but i, I would love for you to elaborate on it okay i mean I'm a, I'm a i'm a huge advocate and you know of technological innovation and uh, you know you probably i'm sure you've read safed and Amu's book you know with the bitcoin standard here. So, so there's this label epoch you know where they talk about the gold standard you know which you mentioned uh, several times and emphasized the gold standard and um now the thing is we never lived i mean our gen- our, our past generations also, we never lived through those label epoch those sort of gold standard times where they uh, as safedan says uh, the the original what i think it's called original inventions you know a lot of innovation you know technological innovations inventions have been created and developed uh, during this time uh, when was that like 18 18- yeah, or something it like was that. like a little bit after the Civil War in the U.S. So like that that ended around 1865. And then I think it took some time for the U.S. to get out of that. But then we had what Americans would typically refer to as the Gilded Age, yeah. so similar to, you know, Golden Epoch, sim- very similar. Um, but then I would argue that ended in 1913 with the start of the Federal Reserve exactly. and World War One, but it was like a 30 year period. This is where of, the decoupling of the gold, right? Already started, not in 1971 or, you know, or yeah. Correct. Mm-hmm. No, I would say 1971 was like the final uh, removal of the gold peg, but it certainly starts in 1913. Exactly, yeah. So thank you, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so, uh, so I had Jeff Wood, you know, uh, several times on my show, and I read his book so many times, and and he's he's a you know great thinker, you know, he's he really questions the whole system, and he and he actually uh, recently said, I don't know, you know, maybe I'm uh, I'm bad at explaining things because I keep repeating myself, like get out the system. It's really, you know, this is what I meant, you know, with the indoctrination and the dogma and the brainwashing and this whole narrative that's like it, we're really it's so brainwashed, so we cannot even think, uh, you know, it's really. Really hard. I mean, maybe we can now, as you know, because we are so deep in multifaceted rabbit hole. But to make it short, the potential of a monetary technology, uh, especially monetary with with Bitcoin, like uh, when you have Bitcoin with the absolute immutable scarcity, and once hopefully we have sort of a Bitcoin standard or hyper Bitcoinization phase process, then that's is when we see and we think in 
in terms of purchasing power. This is where we see, you know, uh, prices, you know, going lower and lower and lower. And, and you know, people are going to start, you know, entrepreneurs and, and inventors, engineers, scientists, technologists are going to start within that hyper-Bitcoinized world, start, you know, for the first time, you know, in a free, in a truly free market environment, start, uh, you know, thinking, designing, developing, trial and error. And then hopefully, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a huge enemy of, of the patent system. I think it's a huge criminal theft system, but it's a chapter for, by itself. Uh, but the potential for new technological innovation, and I'm not talking about people are, you know, like talking too much about AI in digital. And no, I'm talking about like energy, transportation, propulsion technology, anything, any technology that will help, you know, humanity thrive, right? With it, <laughs> with it, I mean, we should be by now, you know, uh, traveling the stars, but we've been stolen at least 100 years, not only of monetary innovation, but, but technological innovation, with it be, you know, starting with Nikola Tesla and things like that. So do you, you understand where I'm going with this? So this is why I wanted to have your take, your opinion, your, your vision, your mission, like what is, do we have time? I mean, to, you know, do we need to accelerate maybe even this process? Because with everything going on geopolitically, macroeconomically, uh, maybe even, you know, uh, Micronova, <laughs> who knows, you know, man, if, if that Micronova cuts solar shot because the magnetic field of the earth is re is being reduced every year by at least 5%. And that is going down like an S-curve downwards, scientifically, uh, you know, proven, right? So what do we do, you know, when we don't have uh, the information and communication systems anymore? Because this is going to be it's going to be des destroyed, right? So how much time do we have to enjoy or as we as humanity enjoy the process of hyper Bitcoinization? I know it's a huge, um, uh, unimaginable, you know, red, uh, what do you call it, uh, pill to swallow or to process, to think about because you need to really go into every rabbit hole. But yeah, I wanted to have your, uh, your, your sort of birds <laughs> over you. Over yeah, this. yeah, it's a big topic. And the way I describe my thoughts on it is that I, I am very confident that uh, sound money is going to bring about better systems of, of course, economics and trade, but it goes far further than that. I think it's going to bring about better systems of healthcare, um, education, energy, government, science, art, architecture, probably more, but, but that covers a, a lot of life um, right there. And someone who has not really spent any time learning about Bitcoin or Austrian economics, they probably might hear what I just said, and they would say, that guy's crazy. Um, why, why does he think that you know fixing the money can fix all these problems? And I really do believe it. it is logical because money is this thing that coordinates all of human activity that that is just true and unless the only exception to that really is if you're going to go and live a hunter gatherer lifestyle um you know don't don't use money don't specialize truly live off the land you can't buy anything from anyone um you know that's fine that that was a lot a long part of human existence as we understand it but i don't think most people want to go back to that so if you're going to live in this world where we trade where we specialize, get very good at producing, and then sell and, and buy things with other people, money is involved. And if you corrupt the money, I think you corrupt every industry, every system in our society. And to your point, um, you there is probably this balance of you want to fix the money and fix all these systems before you know the system collapses from some sort of event. Um, so yeah, there is kind of a, a balance there. Yeah, I'm uh, not saying it's going to happen in the next few months or years, but uh, there is a, a realistic scenario where 2040s, 2050s, this process, these natural, really natural, no conspiracies and nothing, you know, it's just natural earth disaster cycles. There are different layered, right? So I'm just... I'm just as as an individual and as a you know as someone you know with with our with a with a child you know we have a daughter three years old I mean thinking the only mission our my mission is our daughter right so what kind of future is she gonna have it's not about me or you know or my wife you know it's about like our daughter right do you have children uh, John you know what I'm saying it's um, the whole mindset totally changes 
To, yes. And, and I think this gets into time preference that uh, Bitcoiners, whether they have children or not, generally speaking, are much more focused on the future, um, meaning they have a low time preference. High time preference would mean uh, you want something, immediate gratification type of thing. And yeah, I think whenever someone has children, it just um, lowers their time preference even more because they're starting to think about the next generation and the next and grandkids and great grandkids. And uh, I know it's a cliche. We all want to leave the world a better place. Um, what I think Bitcoiners have discovered that much of the world has not yet discovered is actually that improving our monetary system might is probably the number one way you, you can leave the world a better place. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It, again, I'm laughing because I know that so many of my friends would think I'm crazy for saying that because they're not really into Bitcoin. But I, I believe it with every fiber of my body. I even I even think I mean it sounds a little bit uh, esoteric, but I think even the I don't know what to call it, but let's just call it the spiritual, psychological, behavioral, emotional, you know, our in, our human interaction would by orders of magnitude, you know, I mean, totally improve and, and transform. To be honest with you, this is what I'm totally. I mean, I know it in, in deep in my heart and soul. I know, but it just the thing is. Okay, what do you think? Let me ask you this. What do you think are, would be the triggering points or the, I know it's it phases, but uh, as with technology, you know, it exponentially accelerates, whether it be, you know, mobile phones or uh, digital technology, a sailor, you know, loves to talk about this, the exponential escalation. Like what, what, what would need to happen or what kind of critical mass uh, would we need, you know, because we don't need the whole humanity. What we need maybe is, 3%, 5% of Earth's population, you know, adopting it, using it, you know, and and then all of a sudden, you know, it just goes like, you know, it, it just uh, accelerates by orders of magnitude. Yeah. And I think something that's informative here is uh, new adoption curves of, of technology. I think that is just the reality that, you know, not everyone adopted the internet overnight. Not everyone adopted uh, having a cell phone overnight. There's the you know, it's in business school textbooks, but it's like the early adopters and then, you know, the mainstream people and the late adopters. And there's probably some other groups in there, but that's that's kind of the gist of it. And I think Bitcoin, uh, that largely applies to Bitcoin with, with one exception, because Bitcoin is uh, a monetary asset. So the adoption curve of, this is, this is actually an interesting topic, but it's a little tricky to explain because let's take like Amazon, um, the uh, company, Amazon. Uh, Amazon's adoption probably just kept going up and up and up over time, going all the way back to the late 90s. But if you look at Amazon's stock price, it crashed by like 90%. Oh my, yeah. So, yeah. When, yeah was so, it like two, when was that approximately? When um, it, 2000 something or? No, it, it was it was it coin it was two thousand one because it yeah. coincided with the uh, the nine nine eleven uh -huh. and the market sell off were like closely connected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, Amazon fell by over ninety percent from its high before two thousand one to its low in two thousand and one. Um, it's not as if people just stopped using Amazon. It was just that the valuation and the price um, got out of line with reality. So you have to always know if you're talking about something, adoption in terms of price or adoption in terms of like users um, and the network and the platform. So I think, and, and Bitcoin is pretty similar here. If you look from 2020 to now, I think Bitcoin users has just gone up. Um, the uh, ease of use, like the platforms for acquiring it, platforms for holding it, devices for holding it, it's all just gotten easier. Uh, more merchants accept it now than they did three years ago. But that doesn't mean the price just goes up in a straight line. Um, the price is is different. It, there's just other inputs that go into the price. And I think it's just natural for the price to be more volatile, whereas a, the underlying adoption can be steadily building um, underneath it. What about nation state uh, adopter? Like, uh, for example, like, I mean, it could happen. Like if Mila in Argentina, I mean, he is a total free, you know, a market, uh, awesome economist actually, uh, right? I mean, what if what if Argentina, you know, becomes a, you know, semi or, I don't know, no, exactly actually like like uh, the model, following the model of El Salvador, you know, with yeah. and 
and Bitcoin sort of a standard? What do yeah. you think would happen? I put would this that in the accelerate that, right? Yeah, for sure. And I, I put this in the category of any individual event, you can kind of look at it in isolation and maybe say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Now, granted, if, if Argentina truly makes Bitcoin legal tender, I I think you have to call that a big deal. But, you know, it, it was very easy for a, a, a Bitcoin naysayer to go, oh, it's El Salvador. You know, it's like 5 million people or however many it is. And, you know, who cares? And they they just like, you know, downplay it. It was, it was pretty easy for them to do that. But at the same time, if you rewound the clock to 10 years ago and you would say, hey, Bitcoin is going to be legal tender in 2021 in, in any country in the world, people would have said, oh, wow, that's a big deal. And just the fact that it's being talked about as potentially being legal tender in another country, I think it's a big deal. Um and then I would also relate this to how the narrative has shifted on Wall Street, which was in 2017, you know, you have Jamie Dimon, he's famous for saying, I'll fire anybody who buys Bitcoin, it's a scam, it's a Ponzi scheme. And now you have BlackRock trying to create an ETF. Um, and the Wall Street still critiques Bitcoin, but their critiques today are things like, oh, it's volatile. Uh, oh, it's just correlated with tech stocks. And my point would be, okay, let's take those two things. Five, six years ago, they said it's a scam and a Ponzi scheme. Now today they're telling you it's volatile and correlated with tech stocks. They clearly have come a long way in accepting it. They're still criticizing it, but they're much closer to accepting it. So I think you have to zoom out and see what these people are actually doing, whether it's banks or nation states. And to me, the trend seems pretty clear. It's one of increased adoption but it, it doesn't happen all at once. It kind of has to happen one, one event at a time. Exactly. And you remember like six, seven years ago, yeah, there were, you know, thinkers like you or like whatever, like Parker Lewis, you know, gradual and suddenly, I mean, these people, you know, who really come from within, like yourself, you know, from the legacy, they know exactly how the, uh, the system, how they think. And, but now, I mean, we have an arsenal like, like of, 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 our, of counter arguments of, of factual, like, you know, tick, 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 you know, you can just, just, just disarm them, you know, immediately. I mean, there's so much uh, material, I mean, out there, you know, like, and, and it's been, yeah, it's been talked about now. We even have Bitcoin as a mainstream channels or broad, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's evolved uh, tremendously. Yeah, for, for sure. I think that's a great point. It, it's not as if, it, you know, Bit, Bitcoin's price is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And then there's so much content underneath it, whether it's, cryptography, computer science, whether it's economics, monetary history, uh, energy usage and energy markets, geopolitics, privacy, human rights. So it, it's not as if we're all, and this to me is a big actually Bitcoin versus crypto thing where Bitcoin's price, obviously pr price is important. It, it shows market cap, it shows adoption. It, it does need to grow over time. But that's not the only thing that's going on here. There's so much content under the surface. And I think that's a huge differentiating point between these other cryptos where it's really all about the price. It's just someone says, look, I bought in here and it went up 4x and it's great. It's like, yeah, but there's not really like a narrative there about how it's going to improve society or how you, all these things you can learn about it or these brilliant articles written about it, um, which, which that that is the case with Bitcoin. So I think it's just uh, a matter of time that more people will see that. And it's a psychological, emotional trigger, of course, because, you know, you know uh, recently we did some uh, presentations and we invited, uh, you know, people, but uh, because the price was still low, it wasn't, you know, before this bull run or whatever you want to call it. And so not so many people came, you know, and, and uh, you know, and we were like, uh, it was like comments and it's like, okay, it's once once the price goes up again, you know, we don't even need to do any like advertising or, or marketing or whatever, you know, or like uh, front announce it. Like people are just going to come by, by themselves. Right. So this is a sort of a psychological trigger. Um, but unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, because um, uh, there's a, yeah, just a huge lack of comprehension. Uh, yeah. And oh. I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think it is just human nature. Like you said, it unfortunately, but it's just true that the price going up, uh, does bring people in. And, and I saw this firsthand because when I was on Wall Street from 2020, 21, and the beginning of 2022, as the price was going up, 
more people on Wall Street wanted to hear about Bitcoin. Like it really was drawing them in. And then when the price fell in 2022, they were like, I'm out. I don't want to touch this anymore. Um, and you and I know that's the exact opposite of what you're supposed to do. They, they literally want to buy as it's going up. And then when it goes down, they don't want to buy. But I think it's we just have to chalk it up to human nature. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and you know, I hate to always say, you know, I told you so. I mean, I'm not the t that type of guy, but you know, I mean, I mean, we've been, I mean, we've been planting so many seeds, and you, you know, you also, you so many people. I mean, we've been planting seeds, but sometimes it just takes time. Some people need three months, sometimes some people need one year, three years, or you know, or specific like uh, things happening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So before we wrap up, uh, John, I, I wanted to take like a zoom out. Like, uh, do you see anything like whatever you, we could talk about just a few, for a few minutes, maybe about the bond market? What do you think? I mean, the whole, I don't know, uh, <laughs> anything that's, that's like really uh, perverted at, at, at the moment, you know, would it be, I don't know. Do you have an a opinion on the bond market? Like, could it crash? <laughs> like, yeah, my general thought on that is, I think the investing regime that we've had for the past 30 something years in financial markets is changing and, and it already has changed in the sense that major things that would characterize the past 30 years, it would be things like low inflation, falling interest rates, increasing globalization. Um, that means, you know, cheap stuff from China. That means cheap natural gas from Russia friendly relations, generally speaking, between the East and the West, um, supply chains being built for efficiency instead of resilience, um, no really major conflicts between world powers, uh, US dollars and treasuries being the primary uh, global reserve asset, and then mostly positive returns in stocks and bonds. That kind of characterizes the last like 30 something years. And, uh, you know, to anyone listening, they probably are noticing that most or all of those trends in the last two years have started to change. Uh, we're, we're seeing higher, the highest inflation since the 80s. Um, we've never, like the pace of interest rate increases is the fastest, maybe all time, but, you know, we're seeing interest rates we haven't seen since pre-financial crisis. Um, obviously, there, you know, globalization is going in reverse a little bit. There's this concept of reshoring happening where countries are realizing, okay, we can't be entirely reliant on having that factory that's in China or, or anywhere else. Um, there's more uh, conflicts. Just, you know, it, un unfortunately, it, it is just true. Um, the reshoring thing, again, kind of the same thing, supply chains more so being turned towards resilience instead of efficiency. And then you're seeing countries step away from the U.S. dollar and treasuries as the primary reserve asset. What do you what, what do you think about the potential of this? Yeah, I think you talk about the BRICS nation, yeah, right, and the de-dollarization sort of. I mean, is that is that overhyped? You think, or is that like something a realistic scenario that could play out in times? So? I I believe it's one of these things where the middle ground is is probably true in that sense meaning the people who are really harping on the de-dollarization narrative. Um, and if they're saying it's going to happen quickly, that's probably too extreme. But then the other people who downplay it and say, oh, it's not happening at all. The US dollar is fine. It's entrenched. You know, that's probably too extreme as well. So I think it is happening. Um, China is probably the best example because in 2013, they came out publicly and made some statement that said it's no longer in China's interest to accumulate treasuries. And uh, you can see that reflected in the data, meaning they haven't. Um, and this is where it gets nuanced. And that's why I think the middle ground is important here, because it's not as if they made that statement and sold all their treasuries and never bought another treasury. Yeah, they but have substantially reduced their holdings of tre treasury, right? As a percentage of their total reserves, they have, mm -hmm. but um, they're still they still are buying some treasuries over time. Um, and when you look at foreign countries and their buying of treasuries, it has it has maybe increased in nominal terms, but obviously the supply of treasuries has increased like crazy. And as a percentage of the total, the foreign ownership of treasuries has declined in recent years. Now, I do have to add one um, caveat here is that some people speculate that China is buying treasuries through other entities 
that makes the data a little hard to actually figure out. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to pretend I, I know if that's true, but um, it, I think it's, even with all that said, it's fair to say that other countries are realizing that they're not as excited and inclined to buy treasuries as they were, let's say 20 years ago. I think that's a fair statement. And they're going to start looking for other assets, um, whether it's gold, whether it's other foreign currencies, whether it's a basket of currencies, maybe it's going to be Bitcoin at some point. I do believe it's going to be Bitcoin at some point. Um, so yeah, I think it's happening, but it's a trend that takes quite a while to play out. And then the other huge factor here is what happened with Russia. Um, they got cut out of the financial system. They lost access to their treasuries. And again, on the one hand, you could say, well, they uh, invaded a sovereign nation. That's what you know people say on the one hand. But then on the other hand, you could say, well, as soon as the U.S. and the West decide that you're an enemy of theirs, they just cut you out of the financial system. And any country is going to be at least a little bit worried about that happening to them. So they don't want to be too reliant on holding dollars and holding treasuries. Makes sense. Makes sense. Let me just uh, ask you a final question about, uh, you know, this tyrannical dictatorial <laughs> Uh, plan of introducing uh, actually they're working in right digital id and cbdc's and uh and you know as the president whatever director of the bank of international settlements said they want uh, they want to have absolute control in their own words so <laughs> um i mean in long term i mean my opinion is that it's this is actually good for bitcoin right because people are going to wake up and say holy shit i mean they're programming my money i can't i have to spend it or you know a certain deadline uh it's totally inflationary i you know, and then you go, you know, you know, you're locked out of the services, you can't fly, whatever. So uh, what do you think about, you know, is that good or, or in the long term or? I think it is, this is a huge topic, by the way, like th yeah. this is a huge, <laughs> huge topic, um, like of importance uh, for some, for individuals to think about. It's, I think a, a lot of it's going to, we're, we're going to see this play out in the coming years and decades. My view is that it is a country by country thing. Uh, unfortunately, I believe there will be some countries that will successfully implement a digital form of their currency. It'll be mass surveillance by their government. And maybe, you know, for the first few years, they're not going to wildly abuse that. You know, if the government is smart, they're not going to take a political dissident and just turn off his wallet because uh, the citizens will say, hey, we don't like to see that. But unfortunately, it gives them the power to do that. And I think there will be some of these countries that don't really see that coming and maybe it gets implemented. Um, my hope as an American is that there's still enough people in America that would oppose this. And to your point um, earlier in the conversation, it doesn't have to be 95% of the population. Population. There's this concept of an intransigent minority. Uh, that's where... uh, Corey's uh, terminology. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. And there's, there's so well, much well, precedent. Did you put a percentage on that in transition? What is it, like 5% or something like that? Or I don't remember. Something like that. I think you put a percentage on that, but I'm not sure. Anyway. Yeah, I will have to go back and look to see the percentage. But the, the point, as you made, is that it doesn't have to be 90%. It doesn't have to be 50%. So my hope in America is that we still have the some of the principles that America was founded on, lim limited government, uh, we have a fourth amendment, which is um, you can't have unreasonable search and seizure. If the government's going to come after looking for you, looking through your stuff, they have to have a good reason. Uh, a CBDC is directly in opposition for that. They're just surveilling everyone all the time. So I hope that, you know, America has the, that they'll, there will be countries where it does not take hold. But I unfortunately believe that there will be countries where it just gets implemented and, and now they have to live with it. All right. Do you think there's uh, going to be a civil war? <laughs> Global <laughs> civil war? Seriously, uh, I, mean, I don't think I don't think World War Three will happen. But you know, I, I mean, you know, I'm trying to you know keep my mind open and, and just uh, you know have a realistic assessment of. Uh, do you think like there'll be like you know real like were they intentionally provoked or whatever or, or because you know because people in America fed up a certain percent intransigent minority you know just going to be fed up and say hey not with you know you're not fucking around with us you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and are you thinking specifically within America or are you talking more globally 
I think America is going to lead, to be honest with you. You know, America, yeah. United States has been leading to a lot of, I mean, it's a young country, but the people still have this spirit, you know, this, uh, I mean, that's the whole point, right, of the United States. I hope it's not a corporation, you know, I hope it really, if we're going, or we have maybe going, but I don't know, there are so, so many, uh, you know, uh, theories about that, but anyway, uh, I, I do hope, you know, that, that there's a minority or in transit minority or critical mass that will just inspire the rest of humanity. Uh, yes, on the path. I hope so too. I hope so too. I, I think you're right. The, the counter argument could be that, you know, what you just said about America and that being the whole point of America is this idea of limited government and more rights and freedom for the individual. You're absolutely correct. The counterpoint would be that there's a, unfortunately a huge percentage of Americans who are either unaware of that or they don't even agree with it anymore. So that that is the part that scares me a bit. Um, but, but again, I still am optimistic because there is this intransigent minority. And I, I think there's enough people that understand why America was founded and the principles it was founded on. Um, but it is it is scary times ahead because uh, and it's funny you asked this question because I was just chatting with a few of my friends about um, there was some of this this topic about. Uh, so in, in America, we have RFK Jr. is like a controversial uh, politician right now running for president. And there was a story that came out that some podcaster uh, was he had an interview with RFK Jr. And then a, a advertiser called and said, "Hey, we don't like that. You know, oh, take that, that episode. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, did you see this? And it was just said, making sort of, hey, fuck off. You know, I can, you know, I can put uh, right something like that. Like, <laughs> yeah, basically. And then it, it was it was Peloton, and um, and he was talking with Dana White, uh, who's the C, the head of uh, UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. And uh, Dana White made the point. He said, "You know what? You know, f Peloton." Uh, you know, get rid of the Pelotons that we own. And and honestly, I'm way more in, in Dana White's camp uh, on this topic. I'll just be honest. Um, but if you keep playing this out, it kind of, it, it might sound extreme, but I feel like there's only the logical outcome of that is some sort of civil war because the two groups are not cooperating. It, it's either got to be live and let live and, you know, be more libertarian and open-minded and say, okay, we disagree, but you can do what you want and I'll do what I want. Or it's like this clash where it's just, you are the, you're the enemy and I'm going to de-platform you and I'm going to censor you. And we have to separate because we can't live together because our differences are so great. Yeah. Um, so I, it, it's hard to say which outcome we're going to get, but Secession? right now- Maybe secession? Yeah. Texas, Wyoming going to secede? That would be yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different ways it could play out. I've read people who've argued that some sort of secession is actually a more peaceful outcome. Um, when you start to think about, okay, how do you split up the the military and, and the treasury and things like that? It, how are they it gets very messy. The big question, how is the military, the, everybody, you know, who is in, I mean, are there, I don't know, is there, you know, bad hats, white hats, what do you call them? Like, you know, like, how is the military going along with this? This is my big question, you know? I mean, are they really patriots or, you know, adhering to the oath of, you know, the constitution? Um, this is a big question, I think. Or are they already, I don't know, um, just, just following orders? Um, yeah. But yeah. okay, I mean, that's a whole, you know, new... <laughs> loaded, loaded. You asked the big questions. I love it. <laughs> No, John, uh, I, I really learned so much. It is fascinating discussion that we have and, and conversation. Uh, where can people find you? Is any anything you are working on currently? You want to, you know, anything you want to, you know, uh, yeah, plug in? Sure, sure. So on Twitter, John underscore at underscore Swan. Uh, I, I'm glad I get to post a lot of content there since I've left Wall Street. Um, when you're on Wall Street, you don't really get to tweet a lot, so that's been nice. Uh, LinkedIn as well. I think I'm going to be more active on LinkedIn because I want to get Bitcoin and sound money out to a more mainstream audience. Yeah. And then swan.com uh, for Swan Bitcoin. Um, I will just say it's been very cool to work at Swan and talk to so many people firsthand and have those conversations with people um, who are interested in Bitcoin. And we get a wide range. We get people who, you know, literally... Are, they're just dipping their toe into Bitcoin for the first time and they want to talk about the fundamentals and ask all the questions. And then we get people who've actually been interested in Bitcoin for many years 
and they just said, Hey, you know, I like the content Swan puts out. I heard you guys are trustworthy and I want to use you. So it's just been cool to see every week new people to get to talk to them firsthand who are making allocations to Bitcoin. So that's one of the many reasons that I'm bullish on Bitcoin is, is having those conversations firsthand with people. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you have got, you know, geniuses, I mean, brilliant minds like yourself, like, uh, I don't know, is Lynn Alden part of your team? Like I just read several times, to be honest with you, Broken Money, it's a fascinating book. I mean, it's it's sort of a complementary book to, you know, Safed and Moose, uh, Bitcoin standard, Fiat standard, or the principles of, of, of uh, what do you call the principles of like, Austrian economics? economics or like that. Yeah. yeah, it's fab. I mean, the, the whole, the, the, all these books, they complement each other. They're, you know, um, so yeah, um, it's it's awesome, you know, to have people, you know, uh, writing articles for you guys or you know, doing yeah, that. yeah. Maybe last thing I'll plug is because uh, you mentioned Lynn, and I think she's just hands down one of the best thinkers and writers out there. Um, Thursday, five p.m. Eastern time, we're actually having a free webinar with Lynn. Um, we just a lot of times we do kind of exclusive content for some of our private clients, but there are times where we open it up to a wider audience because we think it's good for Bitcoin and good for Bitcoiners. Yeah. So if anyone wants to check that out, you should be able to go to the Swan handle on Twitter. You'll probably see many posts about it. Um, Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern, it'll be all, it'll be uh, Lynn chatting with a few people from the Swan side. You'll get to hear her macro view. And uh, yeah, you can register for free. Awesome. Good to know. Well, John, it's been a pleasure and honor and uh, really inspirational. Very learned a lot. Um, not only me, but I'm sure my listeners and followers. <laughs> and uh, yeah, John, uh, hopefully we can have another chat maybe in the near future sometime, maybe in a, you know, sort of a discussion forum. I, I'd love to have you and jo Jeff Bruce, maybe, who knows, in the near future, maybe in six months or so. Uh, I'll come back to you and ask you, you know, maybe we can coordinate something. That sounds great. Yeah, this was really fun. Um, I, I got a lot of insightful stuff from you as well. And it's never a dull moment in the Bitcoin world. So, uh, you know, I'm sure six months from now, we'll have plenty more new things to talk about. Awesome. Okay, John, take care. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Kayvon. See ya. Bye-bye.